And as many of you already know, today we are pleased to present historian and journalist James Zug. I almost said John Redder. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Zug attended Dartmouth College, then received his master's degree in nonfiction writing from Columbia. He went on to write his first book, which is entitled Squash, A History of the Game. And now he has uh, written American Traveler, The Life and Legend of John Ledyard. Um, he has also edited the writings of John Ledyard in a volume called The Last Voyage of Captain Cook. He'll be talking for about a uh, half hour, and then he has told me that he's uh, very happy to open up the floor to questions. And afterwards, if you'd like to purchase one of his books, we have a number of them on a trolley right by the registers, and you can buy it and bring it over, have them sign, and uh, enjoy. Thank you. I'm going to start with a poem uh, entitled John Ledger. Only death remains to tell us how great we were. Speaks. <coughs> Only death remains to tell us how great we were great with desire. The stone entablature down by the river tells us of a youth who carved a canoe from a cedar, descended the Connecticut, discovered far places, died the great voyager, far from home, lost in Africa, youthful, valiant, destroyed. But that was in another century. The stone fades, his name only remembered by insignificant lovers in the spring, who read his story and clasp each other, amazed at the intrepidity. They only want to know themselves. His valiancy hallucinatory, his trial of the world incredible. They're heroes themselves, they only want to, they only want to clasp each other. Only death remains to tell us how great we were, speaks the voice of the voyager from fading bronze letters great with desire. That poem was written by Richard Everhart, who is the uh, poet in residence at Dartmouth College, and he's been the poet in residence since he succeeded Robert Frost, the first poet in residence after Frost died. And Everhart is uh, still the poet in residence. He's 101 <laughs> and living in Hanover. And um, uh, he's a really great guy. He uh, won the Pulitzer, and he was a uh, poet laureate. Uh, and uh, I invited Everard to give a reading on the campus when I was an undergraduate at Dartmouth. And through that experience, I, I discovered this uh, little-known poem about a little-known person named John Ledger. And uh, every Dartmouth uh, undergraduate knows who John Ledger is. He uh, is um, he has the canoe club named after him, and there's a bank named after him, and uh, the bridge connecting. Vermont and New Hampshire is named after John Ledger. Uh, and all that Dartmouth undergraduates know about John Ledger is that he cut down a tree. It was probably a pine tree, not a cedar. And uh, hauled out a canoe uh, and, and put it in the Connecticut and paddled away and never came back. Um, and when Frost was giving the commencement address uh, 50 years ago this June, he spoke about how uh, Frost had also left Dartmouth as a freshman. Um, he dropped out. So he spoke about how, um, for him, John Leonard was the patron saint of runaway freshmen. <laughs> about five years ago, I was uh, staying in New Hampshire at uh, my grandfather's house in, uh, in Peterborough, and I was reading a, uh, a novel called Water Music, which is uh, written by T.C. Boyle. And uh, it's a novel uh, about Mungo Park, the great Scottish explorer. And in the, uh, in the beginning of the book, he has a, uh, a paragraph about John Ledger. And he, he says that John Ledger played the violin and had a squint and, and uh, was a real volatile and complex person. And, and I, I thought, wow, that's the guy I knew as an undergraduate. He sounds really amazing. So my fiance and I decided to drive up to Hanover. And, uh, and we went into the Dartmouth bookstore, and I, I couldn't find anything about John Ledger. I said, this is amazing. This guy clearly is so well known here in Hanover. There must be a biography of him. And there wasn't anything. So I uh, went across the, um, the uh, green to the Special Collections Library. And we got there around 429, and they were closing the giant doors of the, of the library. We poked our head in, and I talked to the librarian for a moment. I said, 
do you have anything about John Leonard? Do you have any kind of materials? And she said, we have a ton of materials. We have his letters, we have his diaries, we have the original book that was published in 1783, which has been uh, republished uh, by National Geographic uh, last month. And, uh, and we have a great amount of material, but, you know, really great for you to come look at all that. And I said, well, when's the last time a biography was written uh, about John Leonard? And she said, 1946. And then shut the door. <laughs> that opened the door for you. It opened the door for me. And so we walked across the green, and I, and I told Rebecca, I said, I'm going to write a book about John Leonard. And uh, so five years later, uh, we, have, we have the biography that's come out. John Ledger uh, <clears throat> was a great explorer, as, as Dick Eberhardt says, uh, and, and he's chiefly uh, renowned for the fact that he was the only American on the third Cook voyage. Captain Cook led three voyages. The first two were spent exploring the South Pacific. The third voyage was focused on finding the Northwest Passage, which was a cartographer's dream that there must be a way to sail through from the Atlantic to the Pacific through North America. Sort of, you could go in at Connecticut and you'd end out in California. And um, uh, so they sent Captain Cook, the, the, the famous explorer, on a third voyage in 1776. He, he sailed on July 12th, um, about uh, eight days after the Declaration of Independence, with two ships and 200 men. Of course, if they had left about a month later, uh, the British government probably wouldn't have sent them off and would have kept the ships and the men to go fight in North America. And uh, a year later, they so believed in the Northwest Passage that a year later they sent another ship to Newfoundland to meet Cook and the two ships when they came through the Northwest Passage. Of course, that ship failed to, uh, to bring back Cook because there was no Northwest Passage. The uh, four-year expedition was an extraordinary expedition. It's com uh, comparable to the, comparable to the uh, 1960s in our uh, 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 search for uh, the moon and, and, and getting into outer space for uh, just being a really incredible off-the-map kind of uh, uh, journey, um, really changing the whole uh, face of, of, uh, of human history. Uh, there were no maps for almost all the places that they went to, and uh, for instance, they, they came upon Hawaii, which was uh, uh, a series of islands that had never been discovered before since the Polynesians found them a thousand years ago. They were the first visitors ever to Hawaii. Uh, while they were there, John Ledger led an expedition to climb one of the volcanoes uh, on Hawaii, one of the 13,000 foot volcanoes on, on the big island. And they made it about halfway. Uh, they grossly underestimated how long it was going to take to get up it. And uh, of course, it was probably a good idea they didn't make it because that's one of the volcanoes that has uh, been erupting a lot and is scheduled to erupt this year. Um, so I, I was actually hoping it would be erupting on my book tour and I could <laughs> talk about it. But uh, another interesting part of the uh, voyage was that they uh, came onto the west coast of North America, thus making John Ledger the first American citizen. Uh, from the east coast of America to see the west coast of America. And when they got ashore in what's now British Columbia, uh, Ledger saw a very interesting thing. Uh, a lot of the Indians there who had had basically no contact with Westerners. For 4,000 years, there was a village on this uh, part of British Columbia, and they had never had contact with Westerners. And yet they had copper, they had brass, and they had knives. And uh, it turned out, Ledger was able to figure out that all this stuff had come from the East Coast, that it had migrated all the way across the North American continent, that there was sort of an intercontinental trading system, and that the terminus of it was here in British Columbia. And Ledger thought if, uh, if a knife could be passed from nation to nation all the way across North America, probably a human could be passed. And he said, you know, I'm going to travel across North America, and I'm going to be passed like a knife from tribe to tribe, and they will take care of me and then deposit me with the next tribe uh, away. And this was an extraordinary idea, uh, and this was really the catalyst for his uh, dream of walking around the world. Um, at the end of the voyage, he came back to the U.S. and wrote a book about it, uh, which became a bestseller um, and uh, was a, the catalyst for copyright protection, interestingly enough, um, uh, as well as uh, helping launch his career as an explorer, um, as a known famous person. He decided to uh, get involved with trading furs. 
and he set up a fur trading company with the wealthiest American at the time, Robert Morris, the famous financier of the revolution. And uh, their plan was to send two ships, one directly to China uh, that would return to Philadelphia. The other one would go to the, uh, to the Pacific Northwest, buy sea otter furs, take them over to China and sell them, and then come back to Philadelphia. And uh, because uh, the partners that Robert Morris and Ledger put together in this, in this firm were stealing all the money, uh, they were only able to get enough uh, capital together for one ship, and that ship went directly to China. It was the first U.S. ship to ever go into the Pacific, and it launched the China trade, and it brought the American economy into the Pacific, uh, and brought the whaling industry into the Pacific, etc. So it was a really apocal uh, uh, journey. Uh, unfortunately, Ledger wasn't on it. He went to France uh, to get backing for his plan, and he formed a company with John Paul Jones, the famous sea captain, um, Jones, like Ledger, had a very complex uh, personality, and that company didn't, uh, didn't succeed either. Uh, and so Ledger uh, was sitting there in Paris, uh, becoming good friends with uh, the minister, the American minister to France, John Thomas Jefferson, and they cooked up a plan to uh, have Ledger walk around the world. Um, and so he uh, uh, went to London and raised some money. Uh, he also raised some money in France. Uh, the uh, Marquis de Lafayette, the famous uh, general, gave him a lot of money and uh, contacts. He was in London and then he set, set off on his great uh, journey around the world. And uh, he left with two dogs, an axe, and a peace pipe. And the two dogs were for company and also for hunting. Lewis and Clark had a famous Newfoundland on their uh, uh, journey across North America. And uh, so he probably had Newfies on, on, his, uh, on his trip. One of them died in Germany on the Elba River. The other one died in Lapland when Ledyard uh, ended up uh, cross-country skiing through Lapland in the winter, uh, almost dying himself. And he made it to St. Petersburg um, and then um, continued on uh, through Siberia with his axe to cut down firewood and the peace pipe to smoke with the natives that he met along the way to become friends with them. He made it all the way to eastern Siberia when Catherine the Great found out that he was in the country and had him arrested. Uh, he, she was worried, quite rightly so, it turns out, she was worried that he was spying on her fur trade system. <laughs> At the time, uh, the, uh, Russia was developing what was an extraordinary uh, uh, system of fur trading posts. They set up posts as far south as 100 miles north of San Francisco, and even in Hawaii. Of course, fur trading in Hawaii isn't a great business. Um, but they, they set up these uh, posts all around North America, and uh, they were worried that John Ledger, somebody well known for being interested in the fur trade, uh, wasn't there as sort of an uh, a innocent American walking around the world, uh, which would be impossible, so that couldn't be true. Uh, but they thought he was there to learn more about their fur system, fur trading system, and uh, set up a rival company. So he was uh, uh, escorted to the border with Poland, where he was told never to come back into the, uh, into the empire, or he'd be hanged. Uh, he made it back to London, and uh, his patrons there said, well, how about you go to Africa? And Ledger said, great, I'll go tomorrow morning, <laughs> instead of taking you know, a year to recover from this extraordinary journey. And a month later, he did leave London, and he went down to, uh, to Alexandria. His plan was to go down to Cairo, then over to Mecca, and to become the first Westerner to go to Mecca then to cross the Red Sea and bisect the African continent, uh, go to Timbuktu, uh, cross through the Sahara, and end up on the Atlantic Ocean. Um, like his uh, dream of walking around the world, this was quite improbable. Um, uh, and he died in Cairo um, in 1789 at the age of 37. He died of dysentery um, um, and, uh, and died alone in a monastery. So uh, he was an extraordinary traveler, traveler, as Eberhardt says. He also was um, a, really, uh, a real visionary. He was somebody that uh, broke the mold of explorers. There was an explorer named Jonathan Carver. Does anybody know who Jonathan Carver was? Well, at the time, he could have been considered quite an important traveler. He explored the upper reaches of the Mississippi in the 1760s in what was then considered a really incredible uh, exploration. But Jonathan Carver had two things going against him that Ledger uh, did. It took him 10 years to write his book about his travels. 
Leonard immediately got back from, from the Cook Voyage and wrote this book, and it became a bestseller, and he promoted it, and he gave out copies to people. Uh, there's a letter that he wrote to uh, Thomas Jefferson saying, where's my book? And Jefferson, well, I lent it to the wife of uh, Lafayette, and I don't have it back. I'm sorry. So he was, he was always talking about his book. Uh, Carver took 10 years to write his book. And uh, the other thing was is that, that Ledger uh, had these great dreams. Carver's dream was to explore the upper reaches of the Mississippi. It doesn't really capture the imagination. Ledger's was, I'm going to travel around the world. And this was really extraordinary. He also was uh, 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 unusual for his time that he marketed himself. Everybody else was very humble, and, and you got sort of put along in a great big expedition that the government paid for. Ledger decided to go alone, and he, he, he would go around collecting money from people. The last six years of his life, he didn't work, and he lived entirely upon donations from, from friends. And, uh, and that's pretty, uh, pretty incredible for that era, especially for sort of an unknown person, um, um, somebody who wasn't connected to high society uh, in, in London and in France. He uh, also did something uh, quite extraordinary in that he got a tattoo. Most of the sailors on the Cook voyages got tattoos. Tattoo is a Polynesian word, and uh, tattoos were uh, something that were seen all over the world. Uh, native peoples on, on all the continents had tattoos, but they had completely disappeared from Western Europe by the 18th century. And when the first ships in 1767 went to Tahiti and saw the tattoos, they started getting tattoos, and they come back to London, and everybody said, wow, that's incredible. And the Tahitians were famous for their tattooing, and they believed that tattoos sealed in your soul. So they would have huge tattoos. Most of their body would be covered with tattoos. And these sailors started getting tattoos in the traditional sailor places, you know, on their bicep or on their chest, on their legs. Well, Ledger got a tattoo on his hands. Now, at the time, he might not have been thinking about this, but I have this idea that he was. In the 18th century, when you were in London or in Paris, you wore clothing that covered up your entire body. And the only thing that would be visible would be your face and your hands. So he got a tattoo on his hands. And this was a way of saying to everybody, look at me, I was with Captain Cook. I've been to Tahiti. I have great stories. I'm a charismatic person. You should get to know me <laughs> and give me your money. And that's, that's, that's exactly what happened. For six years, he just lived off other people's money. And uh, so he marketed himself. I mean, if he was around today, he would have a website, he'd have corporate sponsors, <laughs> he'd have a press agent, and he'd be, you know, climbing Everest live on the Internet, and you could watch him going along, and he'd answer your questions. And he would be that kind of person, very outgoing and, and, and a real salesman. And that was entirely new. Nobody had done that before. Um, and after him, a lot of people would, would follow exactly in, in his path as far as marketing himself. Most people who have written a biography come to dislike their subject in a way. It's sort of like a relationship. In the beginning, it's all romantic. And there we are walking across the green saying, I'm going to write this great biography of this incredible guy. Well, as I started uh, writing it, I, I learned a little bit more about him and some of the things I didn't really like and, and, uh, and it was a little bit hard to, to uh, have that same passion for John Ledger. He, uh, he, was, um, he was famous and his, his book on, on the Cook Voyage, his memoir, was famous for being sympathetic to natives. Uh, Cook was killed on a beach in Hawaii on Valentine's Day, 1779. And all the accounts that were published after that voyage, except for one, were very positive about Cook, and they blamed his death on the native Hawaiians. Now, the only person who said, well, maybe Cook was responsible or partially responsible for the incident, and partially to blame for his own death, the only person to say that was John Ledger. So in the 19th century, when we colonized Hawaii, uh, John Ledger's book was sort of very well known, Mark Twain refers to it when he went to Hawaii, and people would say, well, you know, here's John Ledger, the only American on the voyage, giving a sort of, you know, anti-British uh, take on the whole incident. And um, furthermore, Ledger was always writing about native peoples, and, 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 and in the 19th century, people would say, well, you know, here's what John Ledger said about the native Siberians, or here's what he said about the native Aleutians. So I thought, God, this guy is so sympathetic to Native peoples. Well, it turns out he was, he was but he was also anti-Semitic, and he was very racist, and he sort of divided the world into savages 
in civilized peoples. And, you know, and he had some sort of distasteful things to say. Those distasteful things are all in, his bo in the book that I edited, uh, so you can read about them. And, it, you know, at one point he'll say, these people are so great, they're so interesting, and here I am living in their hut and eating their food and going to their weddings, and it's amazing. And the other time he's saying, you know, they're really dirty and stupid and their political systems are, are a joke. And, you know, so he, 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 he's much more complex than, than, than I first uh, thought. Um, John Ledyard fell in love twice, uh, once in, in Connecticut and uh, once in St. Petersburg. The New York Times last Sunday described him as a robust heterosexual. <laughs> and, um, and he was, but he, he kept on moving and uh, traveling and he wouldn't settle down. And he would write about, oh, how I wish I just could move back to Connecticut where he grew up and, and live on a farm and, and I mean, all this, this kind of, my, of mice and men uh, image that he carried around with him. And yet he'd keep on moving, and he'd fall in love with some woman, and he'd fill his letters with these, these uh, memories of her, but he would keep moving. And, uh, when I, and, and so that seemed a bit interesting. And at the end of writing the manuscript, I, I looked back and I said, wow, this guy keeps on getting into fights. He gets into fights all over Polynesia. He gets into fights in Hawaii when, when Cook was killed. In London, he got into a fist fight outside of a theater. And uh, most egregiously, he's snowbound in a uh, tiny village in eastern Siberia for eight months. And he gets into a fight and challenges the governor of this village to a duel. Oh, <laughs> so, you know, I put that all together and I said, you know, this guy has manic depression. He would spend all these days alone in his hotel room and he wouldn't go out. And then he'd write these letters in this great big frenzy about, oh, I'm going to travel around the world and I'm going to travel to Mecca and I'm going to do all these extraordinary things and he would write about how he was in a frenzy and then the next day he'd write about how he was you know full of melancholy and couldn't leave his hotel room so in a way he probably had what we would today uh, describe as manic depression so that was very interesting and it, it, it just painted a, a much richer and, and more textured picture of of somebody um, than than I had originally uh, thought about and yet despite that complexity I, 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 when I finished the, the book, I really felt inspired by John Ledger. And the reason was that he was such an American. You know, at the time, America was just developing itself and it was just becoming a real country. And there was a real insecurity about, about America. And Americans didn't feel proud. And, and, and he writes about how uh, in, in British Columbia that the natives there should feel proud about their achievements because they had nothing to do. They, they didn't have what Westerners had in terms of technology, and yet they were able to, de to devise <coughs> an incredible whaling system. The equipment that the natives had in British Columbia to, whale, to, to hunt whales was really quite complex. And, and Ledger said, you know, that's amazing. It, it's just like they were Newton. And, and he compared the natives to, to Newton, saying, you know, if, if the native uh, uh, British Columbians had had what Newton had, they would probably have achieved the same uh, degree of, you know, sort of thinking and philosophizing. And, uh, and, and, and I think a lot of Americans read that in his book and said, you know, that's right. It, um, that, that, that we too have, have, have some great things about our culture and our society, and we don't need to ape uh, uh, Europe, and, and that we are Americans, we're not British citizens. Uh, and he was a very patriotic American. He didn't fight uh, uh, for, the, uh, 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 for the Americans during the Revolution. In fact, in March of 1775, he gets on a ship and goes to England, which is a bit unusual if you're, you know, uh, seriously patriotic. But he always said, I don't want somebody else to uh, be the first person to go across North America. I want it to be an American. It should be an American and it should be me. Um, and of course it was a British uh, uh, person who was the first to, um, to go across North America in 1793 and, and Ledger would have been quite disappointed about that. Um, but he was also American uh, because he had great dreams. He said, I'm going to walk around the world with two dogs, an axe, and a pipe. I mean, it's incredible and it's impossible. There's no way he would have made it. But uh, as, as one historian uh, wrote about uh, describing this, this dream of letters, he said, you know, the peace pipe wasn't used west of the Rockies. 
So the the Native Americans living in in, Cal in you know California wouldn't have known what he was doing when he showed up with his peace pipe. But that was later with his dreams that that he dared to dream the impossible. And ever since uh, ever since then, other Americans have dreamed the impossible. Whether it you know it's in in science or whether it's in exploration, they've always said, you know, we are going to do something that everybody else says can't be done. And uh, in that spirit, uh, you know, you always feel that John Leonard still lives today. So we made bumper stickers. <laughs> Leonard lives. And uh, these are uh, being seen all over uh, North America, <laughs> even here in Concord. And I expect everybody to have, have one on their car. So that's uh, all I'd like to say about John Leonard. Questions? Joyce? If he had lived, would he have been not Lewis or not Clark, but would good old Tom send him? Well, uh, the, the last person he wrote a letter to was Jefferson uh, from Cairo, um, saying, I'm about to head off into Africa, uh, in, into, into the desert. And um, he had seen Jefferson uh, a couple months earlier in Paris, and Jefferson was very upset with him because he, he he shows up in Paris, and Jefferson expected him to sort of be in Kentucky or California or somewhere in North America at that moment. And he says, what are you doing here? And, and Ledger said, well, I'm actually going to explore Africa. And a bunch of British people have given me money to go do that. And Jefferson was very upset about that. Um, and so Ledger wrote, wrote, you know, wrote about that in, in his letters from, from Egypt, saying, you know, I'm really sorry, but I'm going to go see Africa, explore Africa, and then I'll go do North America. So uh, in the back of his mind was this dream about exploring North America. Ledger could have gotten a ship uh, to take him to British Columbia, but he said, no, I want to go away all the way around the world. Because for him, it wasn't just enough to cross over North America. He wanted to cross over the entire world. He felt that that would make his name, that he would become famous for uh, you know, circ circumambulating the world. He didn't think he'd become famous for exploring North America. So he, his dream of exploring uh, North America wasn't that strong. I um, mean, he gave it up to go uh, to go uh, explore Africa, um, and uh, I, I, what happened was there were three failed expeditions to ex explore North America. Um, Ledyard's was the first, and there were two more, and uh, both of them were individuals. And um, uh, Jefferson got the idea: you know, you, you need to send a whole group of people. Um, that basically you need to give money and, and uh, supplies to Native Americans, that then they're not going to just put up with you and let you live in their village for the winter um, if you don't have any money. And so, um, and, and, and you know, people might get killed. And so the Lewis and Clark expedition was quite a huge expedition in comparison to Ledyard with his two dogs, Axe and, and Pipe. Um, and it'd be very surprising if Ledyard had gone on that on that trip, you know, um, he definitely chafed at being uh, a member of the uh, of the uh, Cook voyage. He wanted to, he kept on trying to leave and go do these do these uh, little expeditions. Um, so uh, whether Jefferson was sent him alone, it could have happened. Um, and we we always wished Leonard had left from St. Louis uh, instead of from London to explore North America, because if he had been on the Mississippi. And, and, and with his, uh, his, his sort of magnetic personality, um, his, his vast interest in languages, um, and his ability to uh, survive hardship, um, he very well might have been able to make it to the, uh, the West Coast. And of course, Lewis and Clark were supposed to hop on a ship um, uh, when they got to the mouth of the Columbia, because all the people were fur trading uh, by then on the coast there, and just come home by ship um, if they wanted to. And, uh, so Ledger probably would have done that and, and become famous. But then again, there have been so many biographies of him, and I wouldn't have been able to write mine. <laughs> yeah. yes. I was wondering about his early life and his parents, and did he show uh, uh, his desire to search and adventure and so on when he was young? He, he, he had a, an ordinary li life as a child. He grew up in Groton, Connecticut, which is now the submarine capital of the world, um, uh, next to New London. And um, his father died. His father was a sea captain and died when Ledyard was 12. And um, uh, his grandfather uh, sort of disowned Ledyard from the family business when Ledyard turned, uh, when, Led when he died and Ledyard turned 21. 
expecting as the oldest son of the oldest son uh, to come into an enormous estate worth hundreds of thousands of dollars today. Uh, but his grandfather had basically disowned him, and, and, and which was uh, a liberating uh, uh, incident as well as being uh, hard, hard for him. He probably would have been uh, taken into the family business, which was uh, importing and exporting, and, and uh, they owned a lot of land. The Ledgers were one of the wealthiest families in Hartford and uh, uh, in Connecticut. Um, but because he, he was sort of kicked out of that, he was able to explore. Um, the first times he ever sort of revealed his, uh, his, his uh, interest, his wanderlust uh, in traveling was uh, when he went to Dartmouth um, and, and how he got there um, and how he left were sort of unusual and that was where he started expressing himself as an as a explorer. Yeah. There was a Ledger in Connecticut, so... There's three Ledgers in America. <laughs> All named for him? No, none of, the, none of them are named for him. <laughs> Not even Connecticut? Ledger, Ledger, Connecticut is named for his uncle, oh. uh, the Colonel William Ledger, who was the uh, American Revolutionary War hero, though probably nobody here uh, knows <laughs> why. Uh, the British, under Benedict Arnold, attacked uh, Groton in New London in 1781 and uh, uh, about 80 men were defending uh, Fort Griswold, which was the fort in, Gr in Groton. They surrendered, and the British massacred all the uh, Americans after the surrender, including their commander, uh, Colonel William Ledyard. So in 1826, uh, the town of North Groton was renamed after William Ledyard. And today, of course, it's the home of the world's largest casino, Foxwoods. Uh, Ledger, uh, New York, which is up uh, in the Finger Lakes, uh, is named after Ledger's first cousin, Benjamin Ledger, who he wrote a lot of letters to in this book. Um, and Benjamin Ledger uh, left um, uh, Groton and uh, went to New York and then eventually up to uh, uh, what's now Ledger, uh, New York. There's also Ledger, Iowa, and I was really excited, aha, this is going to be it. And uh, so I called them up and, and uh, they pronounced it Ledyard. And Ledyard, Iowa, uh, is named uh, was named by a governor of Iowa, um, and he moved there after he was governor. And he decided to name his new town after the town he was born in, which was Ledyard, Connecticut. <laughs> so uh, there are no Ledyards uh, in, in America named after him, except for Ledyard Bay, which is in uh, Alaska, uh, above Bering Straits. And uh, in, in the 70s, the 1970s. The U.S. government, for some reason, and what probably was the, there was a Dartmouth guy in the in the government somewhere. Uh, they named uh, they, they named the bay Ledger Bay. Um, so there is one place in in the world that's uh, named after John Ledger. So. One more question? Yes. You never. I don't think you really ever revealed how you feel about John Ledger now. Well, I love him because he's making me tons of money. Um, it's, been, it's, it's actually been interesting since I, I've uh, been out talking about the book, and I, I've now um, uh, been doing events for uh, about a month now, three weeks, and, uh, and, and talking about them on, on, on the radio and, and, and so forth. It's, uh, I, I've really kind of learned more about him. Um, I mean, you always learn through the process, and you learn a lot about somebody when you write about them. Um, not only reading about them, but then the act of writing changes how you feel about them, and, and, and now talking about him. Uh, and, and I never really had articulated what a great dreamer he was. The original title for the book was Great with Desire, which was from the Eberhardt poem. Uh, my publisher was worried that this book would not be put into the biography section, but put in the human sexuality section. And so we had we had to change the title uh, to uh, American Traveler, John Ledger, the man who dreamed of walking around the world. And I never really understood that that part of the uh, the subtitle, and I, I didn't really think about it. And um, and I didn't write a lot about how he was such a great dreamer and and, and, and how that was so American of him. Um, to have these incredible, improbable dreams, um, and since I've been out on the t on the tour, that's really come out of my talking about him. I, I didn't know what I was going to talk about the first time, and I ended up talking a lot about that. And now that's what I talk about. And uh, and Ledger really was incredible in that way. And so uh, I've kind of come full circle. His passion, his charisma, uh, was what initially got me interested in in him five years ago. 
And now um, that's what I talk about today. So uh, I kind of push away the, the negatives um, a little bit and, uh, and I'm more interested in the positive. Uh, a good friend of mine was wondering how much of John Ledger did I see myself and vice versa, and is that why I wrote about him? Um, and and I, I think some of that was there. Um, but I, I certainly don't have dreams uh, like like him. I, I definitely am much more domestic these days. So, well, thank you. So, oh, one more question. What's your next book? What's be my next about? book? Yeah, yes, that's, that before, that's a tough question. Yes. I'm working on a, a couple projects that have already been going, including a, uh, a, a go, I'm ghostwriting a book for somebody uh, who's the tennis and squash coach at Trinity about teaching parents how to raise their children in sports, oh, which everybody here in Boston knows is a key issue. Um, so, um, girls and boys, yep. So he's, uh, so we're working on that and uh, I'm perennially working on a book about South Africa that I've been working on for 15 years and that's literally still going. Um, and, uh, and I have a couple uh, freelance projects to make money <laughs> and uh, spending uh, a lot more time with uh, my year and a half year old uh, baby son. So uh, that's what's going on this year. So. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.